In 1919, the North End was one of the most congested neighborhoods, not just in the United States, but in the entire country. About 40,000 uh, people, mostly Italians at that time of Italian heritage, uh, lived in about a square mile. Uh, and one historian said that the North End was as congested as Calcutta, India at that time. So a very, very congested residential neighborhood and an extremely busy commercial neighborhood, particularly the waterfront here on Commercial Street which is one of the busiest commercial shipping waterfronts um, in the entire East Coast. We are overlooking Commercial Street, which is the site of the molasses tank and the site of the disaster. Um, if you look at that tree next to the blue sign, right there is the plaque that marks the molasses tank site. Uh, it's located three feet from Commercial Street at the time. The tank is about 50 feet tall, which puts it right around the height of that light pole uh, in the baseball field, softball field. Uh, it's 90 feet in diameter. 242 feet in circumference and it's able to hold 2.3 million gallons of molasses. When the tank disintegrates, when the tank collapses, most of the wave heads this way down Commercial Street, south towards Commercial Street. It destroys uh, the North End Paving Yard, DPW Yard, lots of buildings right here, and the firehouse, which is located about 80 feet from the tank, approximately in left center field of the baseball field, the softball field that we're looking at now. Uh, firefighters see the wave coming and are unable to get out of the way. The molasses travels at about 35 miles an hour at the outset, uh, about 35 foot, feet high at the outset, and the wave levels off to about 20 feet high and 160 feet wide. The molasses tank, which is located right here behind me, um, basically collapsed as a result of shoddy construction and poor materials. The steel that was delivered uh, to support the tank, to build the tank, was much thinner than original specifications called for. And when it was put together, it was put together with thousands of rivets, uh, and it was done in a very rushed manner, and it was not put together well at all. There was no inspection, there was no clerk of the works as we would know a clerk of the works today. Uh, the project was overseen by a person who had no technical experience, no architectural experience, and no engineering experience of any kind. And so it was rushed to completion in the fall of 1915, and began to leak almost immediately. Um, so there were structural problems from the beginning. Behind me is Commercial Street, where when the tank collapses, most of the molasses flows south on Commercial Street. It goes for probably about three quarters of a mile and completely obliterates everything in its path. Think of a tidal wave kind of thing. Um, it rolls up and collects debris, people, animals, horses, uh, anything you can imagine in its path and it literally scours this waterfront area and turns almost everything from here to the next three quarters of, of, of a mile into kindling. The Great Boston Molasses Flood kills 21 people uh, and injures 150, many of them very, very seriously. Terrible kind of back, pelvic inju injuries, skull fractures, those kinds of things. Uh, the vast majority of those people fell into a number of different uh, categories. Firefighters, um, city workers who worked at the DPW yard right here. Uh, stevedores and longshoremen who loaded the ships that pulled up into the inner harbor. And in addition to that, there were two children who were killed in the molasses flood, both of them 10 years old, both of them on the scene, um, scooping up molasses that had pooled around the base of the tank while the tank leaked. And there was one woman killed in the molasses flood. Uh, she lived in a house directly across the street from the tank, and her house was destroyed by the wave. I think the Great Boston Molasses Flood is a forgotten piece of Boston history, or was a forgotten piece of Boston history before Dark Tide, for a number of reasons. I think a lot of reasons kind of come together. One is, um, Boston really prides itself on big history, big name history. John Adams, John Hancock, John Kennedy, you name it. These were mostly very poor people, uh, Irish city workers, Italian immigrants who were killed. So there are no big names that are killed here. I think that was factor number one. Factor number two, I think, is the substance itself. Molasses um, often produces a little bit uh, of a giggle or, or disbelief when you first hear about it. I think if this was fire or water or anything else, that would have been uh, much more public and much more of a big event at the time. And I think the third reason is um, 
lack of sources. I was very lucky, very fortunate working with a Superior Court archivist to find some really wonderful sources for Dark Tide and that included the damage awards that were as a result of the court case and the 25,000 pages of court transcript that resulted from the enormous court case that followed the flood.